<laughs> All right, so as we roll along, uh, I know those who attended last year, um, when they heard Gideon Levy address the conference, were really amazed at what he said. And so we had no choice but by popular demand to bring him back this year for his uh, encore speech. Um, Gideon is a, uh, obviously a well-known journalist in Israel with Haaretz. He writes uh, frequently and oftentimes controversially if you are a Zionist Israeli. Um, last year, like I said, his speech went viral online at uh, over about 300,000 views online, uh, English and Arabic. Arabic is actually very popular as well. And uh, today he will be addressing what I would tell a visiting congressional delegation. So with that, Kidina, I invite you to the podium. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, the Washington Report, who invited me here last year, and I was prepared for a lecture in front of a couple of hundred of distinguished guests. And a few months later, I started to realize that something is going on. Wherever I go in the West Bank, refugee camps, villages, people start to tell me they saw me <laughs> speaking in the National Press Club. And it went on and on, and then came the trips abroad, and whenever I get, people talk, talk to me about this legendary speech, which I totally forgot about. <laughs> and then I realized that it became viral and some 200,000 people around the globe watched it, which uh, they uh, put me in a very um, impossible position today because I can't repeat myself. <laughs> and as part of you might know, I am a singer of one song. I am a pony of one trick. And then you were helpful enough to give this framework of what would I have told to American Congress congressmen or congressmen uh, delegation, and this gives me a different uh, framework. But I'm really, really uh, grateful to you and to your people for inviting me again and for making me so famous in the world. <laughs> so many congressmen are coming over, and uh, Israeli brainwash machinery is so efficient that it will be very, very hard to compete with this machinery. But still, I would like to try this time, at least virtually. The question that stands on the basis, or two main questions are, first of all, do they know the truth? Because one can claim that they know the truth, they just ignore it, or they don't care about it, or they think that the truth, that the reality is the right one. Or really, can we open their eyes by showing them the real truth, the reality, the backside of Israel, the backyard of Israel? And the second question, yesterday over dinner, someone was mentioning the question, is American foreign policy in the Middle East uh, based on interest or based on values? And I have my doubts about both. And therefore, to change this is a hell of a mission, but that's the main source of hope for us, for people like me in the Middle East. The key is now in your hands, America. The key is now in your hands, activists, scholars. Because as I said here last year, and this I'm sure will be the last sentence that I repeat myself from last year, the chances that change will come from within the Israeli society are so limited. When brainwash system is so efficient and life is so good, why would Israel go for any change? What is the incentive? And therefore, as big as the hope is, was also the disappointment in the last seven years. 
But I'll try with a virtual tour with some congressmen who would be ready to listen to me. And first, I would take them to certain places that the propaganda system of Israel wouldn't take them. And I would like to introduce them to some people that they would never meet if they'll come through the Israeli foreign ministry or through APAC. I would maybe start our tour with meeting a family in Gaza, the latest victims, Abu Khusa, family Abu Khusa, last Saturday, two and a half at night, in the morning, two and a half, an American Israeli plane in the sky, an F-16, very accurate, as we know, with the most moral pilots in the world, who never mean to kill any civilians, who never mean to kill any children, who are busy day and night only in saving lives of Palestinians. An American jet supplied by your country, financed partly by your country, with a pilot which was, I guess, trained partly by your country, is going to Gaza to take revenge for four rockets which were sent a few hours before on Friday night, didn't hit anything, didn't harm anyone. They were all falling in open spaces, but revenge must be taken. And this uh, F-16 flies over Gaza, over the neighborhood of Bet Lahia, which is in the north part of Gaza. Children, and this I know for a fact, most of the children wake up in hysteria because they know the noise already and they know what follows this noise. Those who were, and most of them were already there in 2005 and 2008 and 2014 and all those operations that Israel had done there know what does it mean, an Israeli jet in the sky. And soon later, the missile, the very, very accurate and precise and sophisticated and clever missile falls on their home. To say home is an exaggeration. Falls on their hut or whatever you call it. And the two brothers, Isra and Yassin, she is six, he is ten, are being killed. I'm not sure if they woke up before their deaths or they were killed in their sleep. This attack, which is one of many, should be presented as it is, as a revenge operation of Israel. Nothing to do with fighting terror, nothing to do with the security of Israel. Then I would love to introduce these congress congressmen and women to a bunch of victims of the recent months of this recent intifada, the third intifada, children and adults and their families who were executed, part of them, almost most of them, without any sufficient reason. I would introduce to them to an American, American citizen, Mahmoud Shalan, 16 years old. Maybe they would care more about an American. <coughs> the army claims that he came to a checkpoint two weeks ago and had a knife. In any case, did he have a knife or didn't he? We don't know because there are very few witnesses. He was, shot, he was shot dead immediately, 16 years old, with a background that makes the belief that he wanted to stab a soldier almost impossible. He came to Palestine to spend some years in his village. He was born here in Tampa, Florida. He had his plans and dreams to go back to study medicine. Would his life even in Palestine was good, very well off family? Did he go really to stab a soldier? Did he endanger the soldier? Was there only one choice but to kill him dead and to shoot him three or four bullets? 
Wasn't there any other choice? Is there any definition but execution? And I give his example, but we have them, unfortunately, on a daily basis in the recent months. American congressmen should know that the life of Palestinians in Israel right now is the cheapest ever. With everything we went through, never was it so cheap. Never was it so easy to kill Palestinians. Never was it so little discussed. Never was it hardly covered by the Israeli media, the biggest collaborator with the occupation. Never was it so natural that any Palestinian must be held as a suspect and any suspect must be executed. American legislators should know this. I would take the American legislators to a few places just to show them and to trust their consciousness. It's enough to go for a few hours to Hebron, to the city of Hebron, say no more. Just take them there. I never met an honest human being who had been to Hebron and didn't come back after a few hours in shock. And it's one thing to hear about those things, it's another thing to see it and to experience it in your, in your own eyes. And anyone who argues still that in the occupied territories the regime is not of an apartheid regime, just come to Hebron, stay there a few hours, and I want to meet one person who would tell me after visiting Hebron that this is not apartheid. But it looks like apartheid, it walks like apartheid, it behaves like apartheid, it is apartheid. And Israel is not yet an apartheid state, but the regime there in the occupied territories is cannot be defined but apartheid. And then I would ask the Congress delegation, are you accepting an apartheid system in the 21st century? Do you understand that you are financing an apartheid system in the 21st century? Do you know that your president compared once the Palestinians to the black slavery? Do you live in peace with the fact that you are supporting it automatically and blindly? And then, to conclude our tour, I would take this mission, this Congress mission, to the most unexpected place, to Tel Aviv. Activists usually don't come to Tel Aviv. I always tell activists, please come to Tel Aviv, because you will understand it only if you'll be in Tel Aviv. Look at the wonderful life in Tel Aviv. One hour from Gaza, one hour from Hebron. Look at the lines for restaurants. Listen to what people are talking about in cafes. Look at the clubs. Look at this vivid society. Look at the beaches. Many times when helicopters are doing on their way to bomb either Hebron or Gaza. Hebron, not sorry, either Lebanon in its time, or Gaza. Look and listen to what young people are talking. Try to ask them what do they know about the occupation. There was now a survey showing that Israel is number 11 in the world in the happiness index of the UN. The Israelis are happier than you, Americans. They are happier than the Germans, the French, the Brits, 11th in the world. 86% of the Israelis claim that their life is wonderful. American legislators should know it. Because this happiness is partly financed by the United States. And is really Israel the first on the list to be supported with so much money? Is it the poorest country, the most unprotective country, the weakest one? What is the answer to all those questions? Why? 
without watching the life of Tel Aviv, it's very hard to understand this total loss of connection with reality of the Israeli society, this total moral blindness, this total interest in any kind of solution. Why would Tel Aviv go for a solution? Tel Aviv DC, uh, the state of Tel Aviv, this bubble who lives its wonderful life one hour away from the place where those two brothers were killed only five days ago. You think that there are there is 1% of Israelis who heard at all that the IDF killed two children just five days ago? Can you imagine yourself what would have happened if Palestinian terrorists would have killed two babies in their sleep? What would we have heard about the Palestinians, about their cruelty, about their brutality, about their behavior, those animals? But Israel, with a jet, with very precise bombs and missiles, that's fine. I would take those congressmen to some of the refugee camps. They should see it. I would have taken them to Gaza if I could. Remember what the world promised Gaza just a few years ago? Where is the word of the world? Remember how many signed obligations to reconstruct, to rebuild, to open up Gaza, and Gaza is forgotten again, and the only way for Gaza to remind its existence is only by launching rockets? This is the message? That's the only way to remind its existence? And then the Israeli right-wingers will tell me, what do you want? Go to Syria. Look what's going on in Syria. It's so much worse. <laughs> and then I'll tell them, the killing in Syria is not financed by the United States. The killing in Syria is not supported by the United States. The killers in Syria do not have a carte blanche to go wild and to kill and to conquer and to depress and to confiscate. And the killers in Syria are not the biggest ally of the United States. Coming back to this question from the beginning, is the foreign policy in the Middle East driven by interest or values? It contradicts both, dear friends. It's not for me to judge Americans' policy, but for me it's an enigma, I must tell you. It is an enigma. What interest does it serve exactly? And what values do they really share? Yes, the American congressman who would come to Israel would find quite a common language with most of the Israeli politicians. We have our Donald Trumps, we have our Hillary Clintons, unfortunately so. <laughs> the level would be also more of the same. They will find most of them common language. Cynicism will be also quite equal in both sides. But still, Americans should ask themselves, and legislators above all, why do we go on with the same policy for so many years? Why don't we realize that it doesn't lead to anywhere? Don't we see where does it go? Don't we see that with these enormous sums of money that the United States is investigating in this occupation project, at least the minimum would have been to use this to some kind of constructive purposes, to some kind of pressure on Israel, to some kind of effort to put an end to the occupation, to change the values or the interests, the policy, the behavior, the conception that the Palestinians are not equal beings like anyone else, the conception that the Palestinians were born to kill, which is shared right now between the United States and Israel. 
I would have expect a mission of the Congress to ask itself, did this policy of supplying carrots and only carrots to Israel, did it prove itself? What came out of it? Next year, we are celebrating 50 years to the occupation. You see, when you enjoy yourself, time is passing so quickly. It's only the first 50 years of the occupation, I'm afraid. But any American delegation who would come to Israel should ask itself, where is it heading to? When the chances for the two-state solution are either totally gone or really in the last moments, I believe that we missed the chance. I believe, by the way, that both America and Israel never meant to go for the two-state solution. I believe that the two-state solution was a trap, which me personally, I fall into it as well. But America enabled it. Now, you can say, don't put everything on us Americans. Take responsibility, you Israelis, right? But America cannot not be taken responsible when everything that Israel is doing today is with the total approval of, Israel, of the United States and the total financing of the United States. We have now those discussions. This is really, when you hear it, you really don't believe to what you hear. The United States, the leader of the free world, the biggest and only superpower in the world, is now negotiating with Israel about the foreign aid, the military assistance for the coming 10 years. First of all, Israel said, no, we think we'll wait to the next president. This president is not good enough. Then they had second thought because they start to think that Donald Trump might be unexpected, <laughs> might be unexpected. So maybe they will do the favor and maybe they are ready to discuss with the Obama's regime about the coming 10 years. America is begging for Israel to accept a deal. It was until now $3.4 billion. America is, and I'm not very good in the details, but America is offering, if I understood well, $4 billion a year for 10 years, $40 billion. Israel wants five. Israel is ready to compromise on four and a half, 4.3 a year. But if you look at the mechanism, if you look at the way it goes, you come again and again to the same question for God's sake, who is the superpower between the two? <laughs> and who is in the pocket of whom here? Now, <laughs> it's really not for me to answer, to give an explanation for this. I understand we have Q&A. I would go for Q&A today, me asking you. <laughs> because I have so many questions to you. How can it be possible? How can it be possible for so many years such a blind and automatic support, a carte blanche to Israel? How can it be that America, who claims to care about Israel, who claims that the existence of Israel is important for it, who claims that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, how can it be that administration after administration, with very little differences between the administrations, they're always competing, the candidates, who will be more pro-Israeli? <clears throat> and in the same time, they are corrupting Israel. So even from a point of view of an Israeli patriot, for me, APAC is an far of a friendly organization to Israel. As a matter of fact, I see APAC as one of Israel's biggest enemies. Because when, because when you are drug addicted, 
And people, I say, I, I, I'm afraid I mentioned it also last time, so it's the second, but only two sentences in a whole speech. <laughs> but it is so clear that I can't help but mentioning it again. A drug addict in your family, a drug addict who is your friend, supplying with more money, he will be so grateful to you. But are you really caring about him? Do you really take care? Do you really love him? Try to send him to a rehabilitation center. He will be so mad at you. But isn't this real care? Does anyone here have the slightest doubt that Israel is occupation addicted? Do you have any kind of doubt that this addiction is dangerous, first of all, for Israel's future? The real victims are obviously the Palestinians, and in many ways the entire Middle East. But by the end of the day, the occupation will end one day, one way or the other. But the occupier, look what happens to the occupier. I would have taken this mission, this congressional mission, and introduced them to some colleagues in the Israeli parliament. Look at the last legislations in the Israeli parliament. Does this meet American values? A, a, a book which is being banned because it was describing intermarriage between races can you see yourself a book in the United States being banned because it described intermarriage between two races? In Israel it happened with the common values between Americans and Israelis. Can you see an American president calling the voters of the day of the election to run to the ballots because the, the uh, Afro-American, the Native American, or the Hispanic community is running to the ballots? Can, can you see it happening? It happened last elections in Israel. And those are the, the common values. Can you see an American president after a terror attack made, let's say, by a Afro-American calling the whole Afro-American community as responsible, speaking about their irritated lawlessness of the Afro-American community because of one terrorist like the Israeli Prime Minister did a few weeks ago? Can you see it happening? But no, we are talking about the only democracy in the Middle East, and the only democracy in the Middle East has the right to do whatever it wants. And then to end up this virtual tour of those congressmen who would never come to listen to me and will never let me take them around, I would end this tour like the Israeli propaganda machinery would start it in Yad Vashem, in the Holocaust Memorial Museum. I would have taken them, because it all started there. Because Israel would have never been established without the Holocaust. And it should be remembered, or absolutely. But then I would ask my guests, who will never come, what is the lesson of it? Never again, as Israeli mean it, which means never again in any price to the Jewish people which gives the Jewish people the right to do whatever they want after the Holocaust, as the late Golda Meir once phrased it, anything? Or should the lesson be never again to any other people? I believe that most of the American legislators or at least a big part of them, know the truth. They know what is being done in their money. They know that the IDF, which is based so much on American money and training and equipment above all, they know very well what is 
the use of this army. They know very well that the main, main role of this army, the most moral in the world, is being an occupier force, chasing after children, detaining children, shooting children on a daily basis. They know very well that with all the sophisticated bombs and submarines and air jets that Israel has, maybe the most sophisticated army in the world, by the end of the day, it's all about maintaining this occupation which no country in the world recognizes, even not Micronesia, Israel's best friend after the United States. They know very well what use is being done, and they support it, and they compete now one against the other, who will be more pro-Israeli than the other, and American society accepts it. Wait, wait for the coming days in APAC here. Wait to hear. I saw that already Donald Trump declared that he's the biggest friend of Israel. <laughs> wait for Hillary Clinton's answer that she's the best friend of Israel. And I can tell you, dear friends, none of them is an Israel friend. None of them cares about Israel. And if this policy will continue, of this automatic and blind support, which enable Israel to go wild like never before. Israel never had this freedom to react as it reacts, never. I remember still years in which every new terrace in the, se in the settlement which was built was immediately the fear, what will the Americans say? Now I think Obama is much more fearful of what Netanyahu would say rather than the opposite way. So the red light is already here, and the red light is shining for so long time in the relationship between the United States and Israel. And let me tell you, the day that there will be an American president who would like really and sincerely to put an end to it, who would really like to put an end to this set of crimes, to this criminal occupation. The occupation will come to its end within months. Within months. Israel will never be able to say no to a decisive American president. I would conclude my lecture by saying, so please vote for him. But who is he? Thank you very much.